Chapter 19 in the Jarvis focuses on the assessment of the heart and neck vessels. Understand the purpose of the physical exam and your need to analyze and interpret the findings in order to prioritize and create your plan of care. The focus in this chapter is on central cardiovascular function, observing the overall state of health, skin color, condition, and edema, assessing the chest wall for pulsations, heaves, and thrills, particularly at the PMI, palpating the PMI and the carotid pulses for rate and regularity, oscillating the S1, S2, and carotids, knowing the correct placement for um, oscillating the different valves, listening for rate and regularity on the chest, and then identifying brewies, S3, S4, murmurs, and rubs. You should be able to identify all of the structures of the cardiovascular system, especially the chambers and the valves. as well as understand the direction and flow of blood. Keep in mind that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart and neither has anything to do with oxygenation. A couple terms that are super important in this chapter, cardiac output. So cardiac output is determined by heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume is determined primarily by preload um, and then secondarily by afterload. Preload is the volume of blood that flows in passively during diastole. It is um, technically a measure of pressure, so it's central venous pressure, but it's the actual volume that is in the heart during uh, the, at the end of diastole. And this causes ventricular stretch. And according to Starling's law, the greater the preload, the greater the stretch, the greater the stretch, the greater the force of contraction, which will increase then the amount of blood that can be ejected from the ventricles with each contraction. Afterload is just essentially back pressure against the aortic valve in the aorta. It's the amount of force that the left ventricle has to overcome in order to open the aortic valve. So it's kind of the um, resting arterial pressure against the aortic valve. You should be familiar or review the conduction cycle of the heart. So electrical conduction, the primary pacemaker of the heart is the SA node, which on most people fires 60 to 100 times per minute. On patients who are well-conditioned athletes, oftentimes their resting heart rate is less than 60. On little children, their heart rate is often greater than 100. And for patients with other medical conditions, it also may fall outside of that normal range. The AV node itself is not a pacemaker. It delays passage of the electrical activity to give time for the atria to contract and to stretch the ventricles further. And then the AV junction is a secondary pacemaker, um, specifically the bundle of Hiss, where it can fire again at about 40 to 60 times per minute if it does not receive an impulse from the SA node. And lastly, the terminal filaments of the Purkinje fibers are what uh, cause the contraction in the ventricular walls. And if they are not receiving any input from the SA node or the AV junction, they can fire at 20 to 40 times per minute. Before you do your physical exam, you want to collect your subjective data. Things that the patient might tell you while you're doing your health history that would be indicative of a cardiac problem would be complaints of chest pain, shortness of breath, orthopnea, a cough, fatigue, 
You might notice that they have cyanosis or pallor, or they may report those. They may complain of edema, hands, feet, face, abdomen. They may complain of nocturia, so having to get up multiple times during the night to void. You want to look at their records to see if they have a cardiac history personally or a family cardiac history. Remembering to ask if there have been any early cardiac deaths of parents or uh, first degree relatives. And then you want to look at their personal habits, which are their cardiac risk factors. Modifiable or inherited risk factors should be examined to determine the overall risk that the patient has for cardiovascular disease. Your book does a nice job reviewing this as well, but things like smoking and obesity are modifiable. Diabetes type 1 is considered non-modifiable, while diabetes type 2 is considered modifiable. Your age, gender, ethnicity, family history, those are all inherited risks that are non-modifiable. Your blood pressure and cholesterol are considered modifiable, as well as your diet, nutrition, activity level, stress management. Those are all considered modifiable risk factors. Patients who complain of shortness of breath, cough, or fatigue should be further assessed for heart failure. The patient who complains of shortness of breath Think about um, how much activity can they tolerate and how has that changed? So if they say, you know, I get short of breath putting my shoes on, um, but six months ago I could, you know, run a mile, that's a huge difference. Um, does it come and go unexpectedly? Is it constant? Uh, is it affected by positioning? Does it awaken you at the middle of the night? Does it interfere with activities of daily living? So you can kind of do your OPQ or STU with your shortness of breath assessment to determine um, the overall impact that's having on their life. With a cough, you want to know um, all of that information, but also, you know, is it productive? What does the mucus look like? Um, is there any pain with it? Any fevers? Any blood? Um, you know, and are they having then associated shortness of breath? What have they done to alleviate it and has that helped? If they're experiencing fatigue, then you want to know, was this acute or gradual? And is it all day long or does it seem to be um, you know, related to a specific time of the day? So we start our assessment with inspection and then palpation. So you want to inspect um, the uh, anterior, uh, posterior uh, chest, as well as the neck, and then palpate the neck um, and the uh, anterior chest. So you're going to look at the neck vessels, look for pulsation of the jugular vein. You can estimate jugular venous pressure. It depends on the setting that you're working in, um, but if the patient is sitting upright and you see um, pulsating, bulging jugular veins, that's usually an abnormal finding. You want to palpate the carotid arteries one at a time, never both at the same time, and uh, again looking for rate and regularity, and describe the location of the apical pulse, which is most commonly found in the um, fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line on the left-hand side. Palpate the apical impulse, so that's the PMI, and then palpate across the precordium, which is the chest, using the palmar aspect of the four fingers, um, palpating the apex, the left sternal border, and the base, uh, searching for any other pulsations, which would be then abnormal findings. Remember that the apex of the heart is actually the bottom of the heart, and the base of the heart is the top of the heart. Um, and that's why we call it the apical pulse, because that's where we listen to the apex, which is a diagram of neck vessels. But you should be familiar with um, how the vessels exit the arch of the aorta and how they supply and receive blood from the upper extremities and the head.
So when you're oscillating, you identify and listen at the correct anatomic areas. Again, note the rate and the rhythm. Um, listen for S1 and S2. Try to distinguish any extra heart sounds. Um, listen in both systole and diastole for murmurs. Repeat with the bell, especially listening for abnormal sounds. And then um, listen over the carotid artery for bruise with the bell. This diagram provides a nice illustration of the correct placement of the diaphragm to listen to the valves of the heart. You should be listening in each position for S1 and S2. If there is an uh, S3 present, the mitral site, which is um, the same as the apical site, is the best place to oscillate that. And if S2 is split, the best place to hear that is over the um, pulmonic valve. So you describe heart sounds by frequency or pitch, so either high pitched or low pitched intensity or loudness, so they're either loud or soft, duration, so they're either, um, they're short for heart sounds and then the silent periods are longer, and timing is either during systole or diastole. S1 occurs at the beginning of systole as the AV valves close, so those are the valves between the atria and the ventricles, which are the mitral um, or bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. And those are heard loudest at the apex of the heart. So you hear those both on the left side of the chest, um, the fourth intercostal space, sternal border, and then at the PMI. Um, S2 is the end of systole as the semilunar valves shut. So that is after the blood is ejected from the heart. Um, and it's loudest, at the, both are loudest at the base. So you'll hear those at the top on the second intercostal space, the right and left sternal borders. When you are listening to the chest with your diaphragm over the different areas, you may hear some abnormal heart sounds. When you're listening over the pulmonic area, you may hear what's called a split S2. You'll only hear this over the pulmonic area. Um, and this happens when the aortic and the pulmonic valves don't close at exactly the same time. So the aortic valve closes just a little bit earlier than the pulmonic valve. And so you hear a lub to dub, lub to dub, lub to dub. Um, it can either be fixed, where that happens all the time, or it can come and go, which is called paradoxical, uh, where you'll only hear it about every fourth beat and it changes with uh, inhalation, exhalation. Um, and so just listen and uh, recognize the respiratory pattern that the patient is having um, and you'll hear uh, it during inhalation and it goes away with exhalation. Um, you may hear a, uh, an S3 which occurs um, immediately after S2 um, and this is uh, a, uh, what we refer to as a ventricular gallop um, which sounds similar to a, like a fixed split, but you can hear it um, everywhere. So the difference between like a, a fixed split S2 and an S3 is that you can only hear the split S2 over the, the pulmonic area. Um, and the ventricular gallop, the S3 usually occurs with heart failure, volume overload. Um, it's also a normal finding in pregnancy and little kids. The um, S4 occurs as an atrial gallop and it occurs just before the S1. And um, that is usually something that we see with patients who have um, like significant coronary artery disease. Look in the chart before you do your assessment if you can, see whether or not patients have a history of any of these and then listen for them. Murmurs then are an issue with valve insufficiency where the valve is leaking and there's regurgitation. This could be a congenital defect that they've had since birth or it could be something that's acquired through um, heart or other disease during their lifetime. Murmurs can occur either 
between S1 and S2, which are called systolic murmurs, or between S2 and S1, which are called diastolic murmurs. Aortic stenosis is also heard between S1 and S2, and aortic regurgitation is best heard between S2 and S1. On page 484 in your textbook, they do a nice job of differentiating between the, um, the normal and abnormal range of findings for heart sounds. Uh, not something that I would expect you to memorize, but maybe write on a note card or have for clinical, um, something that you could reference again if you did hear an abnormal heart sound. So just a reminder that infants and children have different normal heart rates and they have different normal heart sounds. When you're doing your subjective history, you want to know about the pregnancy, feeding growth and activity for infants, um, abnormal feeding growth and activity are oftentimes indications of a congenital heart disease. And then again in children, are they growing normally, hitting those the benchmarks on those growth charts normally, and how is their activity level? Children should not be easily fatigued, they should not easily sweat. Do they have any unexplained joint pains or fever like a rheumatic heart disease, um, scarlet fever? Do they have frequent headaches, nosebleeds? Uh, any respiratory infections or a sibling with a heart defect and all of those things would signify the need for further workup. So uh, remember that an S3 is a normal finding during your assessment of the pediatric cardiac uh, system and a venous hum or heart murmurs, all of those are normal. A child who has a fever oftentimes will have what we call a high volume murmur. So as they get tachycardic and the heart is trying to put out additional blood, they will have um, a, a high output murmur uh, where there's a, a heart murmur present just while they're febrile and tachycardic. Congenital heart defects are also present in pediatrics. Um, so things like a patent ductus arteriosus, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, tetralogy of Fallot and coarctation of the aorta um, are all topics that uh, should be familiar to you from your LPN year. Uh, but basically, they can cause either some are cyanotic and some are acyanotic heart defects. They all can cause um, fatigue, activity intolerance, uh, you know, minimal to extreme symptoms depending on the degree of um, defect and uh, problems with um, normal growth and development. In the aging adult, keep in mind that systolic blood pressure often increases. Um, coronary heart disease, hypertension, and heart failure become more common. So looking for those subtle signs and symptoms is important during your assessment. Arrhythmias also become more common. Um, PVCs are a normal finding and then look for irregularly irregular heart rhythms such as atrial fibrillation and then assess chronic conditions as well as acute exacerbations of chronic conditions and make sure you review the medications and think critically about the potential side effects of medications and what impact they may play on the presentation and current condition of the patient.